Okay, um, okay, this is kind of a fun part of the study design, I think. So onto training session. So we've got strategies to monitor and record physiological, psychological, and sociological training data, including training diaries, digital activity trackers, and apps. So next stop point, we're onto this area study now. So monitoring training data is really important as it can be used to track progress. And there are three main ways to do this. And these include training diaries, digital activity trackers, and apps. And so we have to know all these um, methods. As well as physiological data, psychological and sociological data should also be taken, as this can help to measure motivation levels and also provide context. It was really hot today, so I only did a short session because it was like 40 degrees. Something like that. I think that's all the important slide. <clears throat> okay, so training diaries. I'm just going to summarize these really quickly. Um, actually, they won't be quick, I've got time. So training diaries are usually like literal, like physical books or journals or something which you write down what you did today. Or it might be like a notepad which has kind of got some, like a template included with it. Um, so I say something like, today I did dot 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 and fill in the blanks. Today I did 50 push-ups, 3 kilometers and an hour of cycling, something like that. Um, that might be what you write down your training diary and then you can add stuff like how did I feel today I felt really amazing because I did this really good um I trained really well and I felt like it was a really effective training session or I felt really bad because I only did two kilometers but also I didn't recover from an injury something like that they often provide some kind of context or how you're feeling apps are good because they um apps and digital activity trackers are also good because they do provide information which is more objective as opposed to subjective so just to recap what this means, because I often have students asking. So objective is more like stating it as it is, like fact, that feeling. Whereas subjective is more like I felt like this, or this impacted me because I felt like this. So it's more, it's got kind of an inflection or a bias on it. Um, yeah. So digital activity trackers, um, these are more objective. Often they record stuff such as heart rate, sleeping data, how fast or far you did go. Um, as opposed to, I think I went three kilometers because you know that sign looks like it might be three kilometers away or something like that. Um, these ones are more objective; they're kind of more fact. Um, and, apps. and so we're going to compare. Are we going to compare them? No, we're not. So I'm just going to spend quite a bit of time on this slide actually discussing them. So you must know pros and cons associated with each of these methods. So the benefit, the main benefit of training diaries is that they can be used to actually provide context. So on my own running app, so when I go running, I have an app and it tracks how many kilometers I do or how fast I am or be inclined, stuff like that, which is really useful. But sometimes I might look at my data and go, oh, I only did one kilometer here. Why did I only do one kilometer that week? And I go back and like think about it and I go, oh, you know, maybe I was injured or maybe that was the time we had like a really torrential storm or, you know, it was a 40 degree day and I don't want to go running. Stuff like that provides context. Otherwise, you might look back and go, wow. My training was so bad that why? And you might not understand why. So the main benefit of training diaries is that they do provide context. Um, a weakness, I guess, is like if you just go for a run without anything, um, that's all well and good, right? But you don't know how far you went. You don't know how um, effective your training session was. You don't know how like fast your speed was, if you're improving from last time. Stuff like that is harder to track with a training diary. Um, obviously, we're doing other types of like gym um, gymming, I guess it might be different if you're doing, like, push-ups or chin-ups. I don't really gym, so I don't I do a lot of this stuff at all. But if you are doing, like, sit-ups and things, you might say, okay, I did 30 in a row, or I did five reps or three sets, something like that. Um, that might be more effective. And so that can be recorded in the training diary. But once again, you don't have, like, how many calories were burnt, how, like, intense your session was, how fast it was, stuff like that. It's a bit harder to track with the training diary. So that's the main con. You can't really track stuff like heart rate or kilometers or incline, stuff like that. In terms of digital activity trackers and apps, these are effective in that they do take that objective data, so that's the main benefit. They record things such as heart rate, um, how many calories were burnt, intake, sleep quality, stuff like that. But the main con here is that they don't include that subjective data or the context. So. Yeah, as I mentioned before, looking at the app and looking at, oh, I didn't do so well this week, and you might forget that it was a 40 degree day that day. We also have to take um, three types of data. So physiological, psychological, and sociological. So physiological relates to the body, to the physiology of the body, how your body works, really. Um, so like, 
Um, I'm not sure I say physiological. We'll come back to that in a second. Well, psychological was more of the mind and sociological is more like social. So physiological is how many calories burned? How many kilometers did you run? Um, what was your heart rate? Heart rate is a really big physiological one. Um, heart rate, intensity, duration. It's mostly heart rate, things like that is a big one. Um, energy expenditure. All of those come under physiological. It's really how your body reacts or what your body did, how it acted. Psychological is more of the mind. So how did you feel that day? Did you feel good? Did you exercise well? Did you feel, you know, were you a bit out of it? Were you focused on other things? Did you have a big exam coming up and you wanted to, like, you were stressing about that and so you didn't have an effective session? Stuff like that. Um, just psychological is really more about the mind. Sociological, um, this can be things such as, like, if you were training with a friend. So my friend didn't train today. Therefore, I didn't train today because I don't like training alone. That could be a sociological thing. Something else could be the weather. So if it's a really stormy day and you don't want to go train, um, this comes under sociological data. So stormy day, you don't want to train. So I didn't. Sociological. So also, these three things can provide context. Um, another big thing associated with psychological is motivation. So how motivated you are to continue training. So you can kind of write down in your training diary, okay, I did really good today. I, you know, I beat my personal best for a 5K today. I'm so excited to get to 7Ks next week. You know, I'm really going to kill this 10K, 10K run um, race I'm doing. So if you're really excited like that, that can provide good motivation for you. Um, keeping a training diary and, like, observing your improvements or even looking at digital activity trackers or apps can also be a good log, which can show, you know, as your weeks progress, your 5K is actually getting faster. You're actually feeling less exhausted. Um, you're actually getting a further distance. All of these things are really important as they do help you to provide, like, or attain little goals. So these little goals help to spark motivation and they can provide some context too. Um, so, sorry, these three types of data can provide context also. Um, and so it can prevent you from becoming disheartened. So disheartened about your lack of training a certain time, as you can see the sociological data associated with it. Okay, that was a lot of talking there. I know it was like one page and I just spent ages talking about it, but this is quite a big part of the exam. So to sum up, what we need to know is that we need to know pros and cons of each of these three methods of monitoring training data. So training diaries, pro is context, con is no heart rate, you know, less objective. Digital activity trackers and apps, pro is more objective, takes data such as heart rate without needing to fuss about with it or remember it or whatever. Distances, um, it's taken. And then the main con is lack of context or lack of sociological data. I know some apps do have like a little smiley face you can pick, and sometimes you can write a few lines, but yeah, typically training diaries are more effective at taking this context. Understanding what physiological data is, psychological data, and sociological data, and being able to provide examples, physiological heart rate, respiratory rate, intensity, stuff like that, or how many calories burnt, psychological, motivation, um, stress levels, stuff like that, sociological weather, um, facilities, friend, present, stuff like that. Okay, so hopefully that's all fine. Um, put down any questions if you have any about this area, um, and... Yeah, we'll move on to the next bit now. Okay, components of an exercise training session include three stages. So you've got the warm-up, conditioning phase, and cool-down. So I didn't actually know what the conditioning phase was until um, year 12 PE. So I actually didn't do PE in year 11. I did history, and then I jumped into year 12 PE because history was dropped from my syllabus at school. So I just jumped into PE without having done unit three, unit, sorry, unit one, two. Um, so if there are some fake phrases which you don't understand, just put them in the chat because I understand because I didn't, I don't know if you cover this unit one, two, because I didn't, because I didn't do it. Um, but yeah, I often get questions or, or emails from students asking, I didn't do one, two, PE, can I still do three, four? And yeah, I highly recommend it. It is like a bit of a jump, but I think a lot of the content is quite different between years um, and everything's covered really well anyways. So yeah, you can definitely do it. Um, okay. Compensate training session, the warm up, the first stage. So, what the warm up is, is that it prepares the body and the mind for the upcoming session. It increases the muscle temperature, breathing, and heart rate, and generally just helps to loosen up the body. It often includes gradual aerobic exercises, jogging a lap, and some dynamic stretching. So, warm up quite literally warms up the body. So, you know, you might do a jog of a field. This will help to you know, spark some enzymatic reactions because you're providing ATP energy. 
Therefore, muscle temperature will increase, and so your body actually literally physically warms up. And you might do um, some dynamic stretching, whereby you actually like move joints, their range of motion, keep moving them. This is important here. Dynamic stretching in a warm up, okay? Dynamic in a warm up. This comes up in the exam quite often as well. So static stretching is typically reserved for a cool down, because it helps to like return the body back to pre-exercise levels. So that's static stretching, where you like you know, might hold a position. Grab your leg behind your, lap, your back and just hold it or something like that, or behind quads and hold it. Um, that's static stretching, whereas dynamic stretching is where you keep, you know, windmill arms or whatever, stuff like that. This is important. So dynamic stretching gets the body ready for exercise. It warms up the muscles, keeps them moving, gets your heart rate pumping, stuff like that. So it's useful for a warm-up. Just making sure you know these two differences. The static stretching is for a cool down. In terms of the conditioning phase, this is the main component of the session. Intensity and volume of training will vary depending on what sport is being trained, and specificity is important here. This is where training principles and methods are important. So conditioning is the main session. It's like if you're playing a game of basketball in PE, the warm-up you might have is just dribbling laps, doing layups, stretching a bit, doing some dynamic stretching. That's the warm-up. The actual conditioning phase is you playing the game of basketball. It might be a half-court game in preparation for your race race um your event next week your game next week okay so this is the actual main part of the training session whereby you actually play sport this is where training principles and methods are important finally we have the cool down and this is where you return the body to pre-exercise levels you attempt to remove waste products from muscles helping to re reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and reduce heart and breathing rate Often similar activities that are performed in the conditioning phase will be performed, but at a lower intensity and static stretching may be used to decrease muscle stiffness. So cool down is cooling the body back down to normal exercise, so pre-exercise levels. Typically for cool down, you still want to keep moving a bit, so you want to do an active recovery, whereby you might walk a bit, just do a lap, a few laps of walking around the pitch. So this keeps the heart rate up a little bit before it gets back down to pre-exercise levels. And so this elevated heart rate allows you to continually take in oxygen and try to cycle out those metabolic fatiguing byproducts. As a result, it helps reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and reduce heart and breathing rate. Okay, so delayed onset muscle soreness is DOMS. Um, you guys will hopefully discuss that in a bit more detail later on in the semester. As you actually design a training program, which is a really common stack you'll come up, come over this term, come over, you'll see this term come up over and over again a few times. So. Um, we can discuss, I don't know if there's anything about this here. We might discuss a bit more about DOMS today, for right now. Um, you can also reduce heart and breathing rate as you are doing this, like, slow jog around the pitch or a slow walk. Um, often similar activities that performed in the conditioning phase will be performed. So you might, instead of running around the basketball court, you might just walk around the basketball court. You might, like, jog a little bit or walk a bit slowly and just dribble the ball up and down the court. Um, so static stretching is used here. This is where you hold that position. It can help to decrease muscle stiffness, and it also helps to return the body back to pre-exercise levels, okay? Oh wait, I was gonna talk about DOMS. Um, so, DOMS is delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, there are some methods to actually remove this, or like eradicate it, or make it, reduce it, make it better so it's not sore. You can actually get like a foam roller and just kind of roll it over your muscles, and that can help to reduce DOMS. Um, Keeping the body like moving for a bit, so conducting an active recovery as opposed to a passive recovery can also help to eradicate those DOMS. Um, yeah, foam ball, roller, stuff like that. Or like a pool noodle, often you'll see people rolling a pool noodle up and down. Um, yeah, so I think that's all we need to discuss here. Uh, reducing heart and breathing rate while you still keep moving though.